I'm Joshua Bardwell, and you're going to learn something today. Today, we're looking at the RunCam Eagle Pro. This is the third revision in RunCam's Eagle product line, and they've added a few new features to it, and they've made a few changes that, well, have they improved the things that some people really hate about the Eagle's picture? You're going to see for yourself. In addition, this will be the first chance for you to see some flight footage from my newly rebuilt Korea Rea Talon. In fact, I think this will be the first time I've posted any flight footage from the Talon on my channel. Stay tuned. I've loved the Runcam Eagle's image pretty much since the day I saw it. But there are some things about the Eagle's image that make some of you absolutely hate it. You just can't stand it. And I think the best analogy I can make is that the Runcam Eagle is a lot like cilantro. You know, some of you out there love cilantro. I also happen to love cilantro. And other people hate cilantro and cannot understand how anybody can eat that stuff. And actually, I don't know if this is true or not, but I've read that there's actually a gene that some people have that cilantro has a chemical in it that tastes soapy. It tastes like you're eating soap. But some of us don't have a, the gene that lets us taste that chemical. And so those of us, there's actually a, potentially a genetic component into whether you like cilantro or not. And that's just your little tip of the day. That has nothing to do with the camera. I don't think there's a genetic component into whether you like the camera or not. You just either, either the things it does right you like and the things it does wrong you don't care about, or you hate the things it does wrong and you just want nothing to do with it. And the things it does wrong, you can, well, you can go back and watch my review of the Eagle One if you want. But in short, it has an over-sharpened image. And it has what well, the technical name for it is Moir, M-O-I-R-E, Moir artifacting. It's a kind of aliasing where straight lines look t -t 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 jaggy, okay? You can get rid of some of these things by turning down the sharpening in the, in the camera. Uh, and in fact, I'm, I'm happy to say that the camera I got from RunCam in just new in box had the sharpening turned down by default. So maybe RunCam's listening to me. Hmm. Well, I'm probably taking too much credit there. And in fact, as we look at the images, you can decide for yourself whether you think this one looks better than previous ones or, or maybe it doesn't. But uh, ultimately, in order to get the picture, to get rid of that artifacting entirely, you have to turn the image the sharpening way down to the point where it almost looks like a watercolor pastel painting. It's just too soft. And so there's really not a perfect happy medium where the image still looks reasonably sharp but doesn't have those digital artifacts. Now, speaking for myself, I like the things the camera does right. It has fantastic dynamic range, which I feel like gives a more flyable image. You can see more details in the shadows and in the sky, and that means that you're more likely to be able to see where you're going, especially when you're transitioning from a bright to a dark area or vice versa. I also like the color, although the color is a little bit desaturated. In the Eagle Pro, we're going to see that the image is a little more saturated than previous ones. They seem to have done a better job with that. But it's still not the kind of high contrast, high saturation that you get from a CMOS camera like a Swift or, you know, etc. And that's, that's kind of uh, inevitable. Wide dynamic range inherently means less contrast. You can either have lots of contrast with dark darks and bright brights, or you can have wide dynamic range, in which case everything gets a little bit washed out, but you can see more. So with that being said, let's go ahead over to the computer. Let's take a look at some of the footage that I shot. And then after we've talked about the footage, we'll go through the menu on the camera. I'll show you all the options. We'll talk about the specs and so forth. But let's, let's do the flight footage first. I know you're more interested in that. In order to let the camera make the best first impression that it can, I need to tell you this is not quite in its stock configuration. So the camera comes from the factory with the sharpening level set to a 6 on a scale of 1 to 15. And I've even turned that down a little bit from there to, I think it's a 3 or a 4, I can't remember exactly which. And I feel like that cleans up just a little bit more of the digital noise without over softening the picture. Either right now you're blown away by the quality of this image or you're hating it. You're hating the digital noise. And whichever sort of gut reaction you had when you first saw this image, that really should tell you whether this is the right camera for you or not. The things that to like about it, the dynamic range is amazing. I picked this footage specifically because you can see the, the extra detail in the clouds. The sun is not blowing out the sky. You can see the ground, etc. You can see shadow details under the trees. On the other hand, there's that little bit of over sharpening and digital noise in the picture and the Moyer artifacting, which I'm going to show you an example of here in the freeze frame. Look at the top of the air gate there where there's a little jaggediness 
in the in the line. That's the Moyer artifacting. It's especially visible when you're looking at something like a fence with a bunch of horizontal lines or like um, a shingle roof. You'll really jump out there. Anything with a repeating horizontal pattern really jumps out. But there's a, there's a simple example of it. Now here's some footage with the absolute stock configuration and that you can immediately see that there's more digital noise. Um, the video transmitter is also struggling a little here. I've got one of those little tiny dipole whip antennas on, not an actual proper antenna, so I apologize for the video quality. But uh, you can definitely see more of that video noise, uh, the over sharpening effect in here, kind of a shimmeriness in the image, if you will. Also, if we look at the fence, if we can find a good freeze frame to look at the fence, you definitely will see the Moyer artifacting I was talking about. Here comes one here. Especially as the fence goes off into the distance, you can see that Moyer artifacting. Uh, the, as, the, as the slats get closer together, you almost see like an opposing diagonal pattern in addition to just the kind of jagginess on the right side of the screen up in the foreground. I'm almost a little bit embarrassed to show you this image because number one, we have the, the tiny antenna on the, on the transmitter that's doing a bad job. We got a lot of breakup in the picture. Number two, the sharpening is higher than I fly with it at normally, although this is the default settings. And that's creating a bunch of digital noise that the Fat Shark DVR is really struggling to deal with. So the picture that you're seeing looks so much worse than the picture in the previous clip because the DVR is struggling with the with the digital noise. In fact, in the goggles, it didn't look this bad, although it did look, you know, some of the things you're seeing, yeah, do it does reflect what was actually in the goggles. I can only show you what I've got, though, and here it is. This is pretty much the worst the goggle looks. Let's just move on. Now that you've seen the image quality for yourself, Let's talk about the camera's features and specifications. We'll go through the menus and all that stuff. And the first specification that we've got to talk about is latency. Some people are going to be a little bit surprised to see that I put a CMOS camera like the Eagle on a racing quad like the Talon. Don't you want really low latency for racing? And yeah, yeah, you do. And don't, don't take my word for it. Take the word of top racers who rejected the original Eagle 1 because of its excessive latency. But the days when the latency of a CMOS camera like the Eagle could be assumed to be worse than the latency of a CCD camera like the Swift, for example, those days are gone. And if you look at Oscar Leong's latency testing, he's doing camera latency testing, and he's tested the latency of the Eagle Pro to be about the same as that of the Eagle 2, which is about the same as that of the Swift and so on. It's around about 25 milliseconds. And that's about as fast as most of these cameras are, regardless of whether they're CCD or CMOS. The exception being, like, for example, I think the Night Owl is down in the, sing in the 18 millisecond, 15 millisecond range. Something to do with it being black and white only, I don't know. But somewhere around 25 milliseconds is pretty standard for all these cameras. And the fact that lots of people are racing on Runcam Swifts and so on says that the latency of this camera is just not an issue when it comes to anything that you're doing. Now the camera does have some pretty cool features. Let's take a look here in the menu. And one of the features I want to show you is that it can change from 4.3 to 16.9, which at first is going to seem really exciting. But it's not as exciting as you think, because it turns out that the camera's field of view and sensor and so forth is designed internally for 16.9. So if we look at 16.9, we can see basically we're getting a wider field of view. And in fact, it's 170 degrees field of view when you're in 16.9 and 140 degrees field of view when you're in 4.3. Now, of course, you could always put a wider lens on here if you so desire, and you can order it with a wider lens. If you fly 4.3 like I do, you, I, I would prefer a little bit wider field of view than 140 degrees, although I will say I raced all weekend on 140 degrees, and I didn't really notice. I didn't have any complaints about being able to hit my lines, but I might if I did a side-by-side -side comparison. I usually prefer a wider field of view. Another feature that's been common to all of the Eagle cameras, and, and maybe some others in Runcam's line, I'm not 100% sure which ones do and don't have it, is the ability to switch between NTSC and PAL from within the camera. This is nice because there are sometimes, usually it doesn't matter, your goggles can switch automatically between NTSC and PAL. NTSC has a higher frame rate, but a lower resolution. PAL has a slightly lower frame rate, but a higher resolution. And people make arguments both ways as to which one's better for flying. 
The good news is that with one of these cameras, you can easily side-by-side -side test it, and your goggles will automatically switch between them. Some display devices, like some L you know, LCD screens or other devices, don't automatically switch or don't like certain formats. And in that case, the ability to just switch back and forth in the menu certainly is nice. The next thing we'll talk about is that famous white flash issue that occurred on the Runcam Eagle 2. So on the Runcam Eagle 2, it had a very, very high nighttime sensitivity, and it had an internal algorithm that when it got dark, it would boost the gain to the sensor, which would basically make the sensor much more sensitive to light. And this was pretty cool because if you could go into really dark areas and still have a usable picture with the Runcam Eagle 2. But the problem was that when the lighting changed rapidly, and people noticed this most when they were doing like flips, so the camera would face the sky, the gain would go, go way down, and then it would face the ground, and basically what would happen is that when you finished your flip, you'd be staring at just white. And it would be several seconds of white. And you can actually see an example of this in a previous video that I made where I showed you the fix. And the fix was to turn the gain down in the camera. This is the Runcam Eagle 2, not the Runcam Pro that we're looking at now. The Runcam Pro, I'm happy to say, the default out of the, out of the uh, box settings doesn't seem to have the issue. So, for example, if I take it and I aim it at this light, right, and then I go... That's not, that's not great. Let's take it outside and just test it once. It's not a bright day outside though, so I don't know. But we'll take it out, I'm gonna take it outside real quick and just test it once. Well, I guess I have to revise my opinion slightly. I, I did the little hand in front of the lens test before uh, and it didn't, I didn't notice it. I don't know what was different about those lighting conditions compared to now, but it's definitely happening now. I will say that I flew this quad all day. I've actually flown it for two, two full days, uh, once while racing and once while doing some freestyle testing, and I didn't notice one time that that you're seeing now. But if you can do that with your hand and it, it does the little thing, you know, I don't know. Maybe it would happen when you're flying too. So the fix for that is to go into image and turn down the max gain. And let's try that. Let's just turn it down. And this will change, it'll make it less sensitive in low light, but it'll make it less likely to do that as well. So if we turn that down. Yeah, see that's much better. Turning the max gain down, that's pretty quick. And again, this is a worst case scenario, so maybe that's something you can consider doing if you get this, ever get this in flight. I didn't. Here we've got wide dynamic range, and this is really one of the key features of these CMOS cameras. It gives you increased shadow and highlight detail all within the same image. Now, using it here indoors, I don't think you're going to see much of a difference, but let's try turning it on and off. Yeah, so you can see with wide dynamic range off, that light that's over my head, where is it? There it is. That light that's over my head is really causing the exposure algorithm to clamp down, and then I become underexposed, but with wide dynamic range on, that's really actually a great example of what wide dynamic range does. I'm getting detail both in the highlights and the shadows. That's actually, that actually came out better than I thought it would. Image enhance is where you'll adjust the sharpness, and the sharpness comes from the factory at a manual setting of six. Now you can see I've turned that down, and I think the thing to do with these cameras is just to turn that down to the level where the digital artifacting becomes tolerable. You can see that if I turn it all the way up, Hang on, I can't, I can't read it because uh, 0, 15, there we go. Betaflight OSD is in the way. So this is at max, and you can see there's all kinds of just digital noise all over the picture. The straight lines, if you look at the, the door right there, you can see the, the Moyer artifacting, the jaggies there. At a, at a max value of 15, I think this is just a terrible image. But as I begin to turn these down... 10, 9, 8, 7, 6, and I like to have them somewhere in the range of, they come with 6, I like to have them closer to like 3 or 4. I feel like the image becomes overall pretty good looking. You can still notice those things if you really look for them, but I don't notice them a lot when I'm flying, and I feel like the overall, the better dynamic range and so forth, more than makes up for it. But I know that many of you disagree, and I'm not going to try and change your mind. Frankly, the image on a uh, like a Rotor Riot Swift 2 is also pretty freaking good. Just depends on what you're looking for.
There's one more thing I ought to tell you about this camera, maybe one of the biggest features that distinguishes it from the uh, earlier iterations, and that is it's got a built-in OSD. And I haven't told you about that because, of course, as you can see, I've got Betaflight OSD on this camera. But the ability to have the OSD built into the camera is pretty huge if you don't have Betaflight OSD, for example. Although these days it's harder and harder to find a flight controller that doesn't have one. It's, I guess it's more common on micro quads, although you're not really going to be running this camera on a micro. So anyway, it's got an OSD and you have the option to use it. You access it by pushing up on the joystick. And here's the OSD. You can input your call sign. And I'll go ahead and turn these on. You can see there in the lower left, there is the voltage, the input voltage. There's the call sign in the center. You can, of course, move those around if you so desire. And there's a, a run timer. It'd be more useful if that was a fly timer, but the camera has no way of knowing when you started flying. So I don't use those, but you can if you want to. The other thing the camera's got is it's got a built-in microphone. So if you're looking, it, it, that's really nice because it can be a little bit of a hassle to install an external mic on your quad, and some of you like to fly with sound. I have, I don't personally fly with sound, and in fact, I have heard some people say that it's really disorienting to hear the sound from the quad in your ear, but it's a, it's slightly delayed, or it's slightly ahead of the, of the, of the actual sound. Delayed? Delayed? Ahead. Anyway, they're not in sync, so you're kind of hearing this weird echo, and it really throws some people off. I think it's really nice to have sound in the DVR, even if you don't fly with a mic in your ear. Oh, the other problem with a mic in your ear is that when the sound does break up, it gets super noisy and crackly, and you're like, ah, my ear is bleeding. But I think it's pretty cool just to have sound in the DVR, and I might hook up the mic even if I didn't fly with an earpiece for that factor. So that's the Runcam Eagle Pro. And I think the real question you have to ask if you're thinking about getting the Eagle Pro is, would you rather get the Eagle 2? And if you fly a 4.3 uh, display device, like if your goggles have 4.3 screens, then I think the Eagle 2 is the better choice. Uh, the Eagle 2, its native uh, camera field of view is either 140 or 170 degrees in 4.3 mode. And if you switch it to 16.9, then that changes to something else. Whereas the Eagle Pro is... 170 degrees in 69 and then it gets narrower if you go to 4.3 so if you fly a 4.3 camera i think that the uh, eagle 2 makes more sense if you fly a 16.9 camera then the eagle pro makes more sense if you do get the eagle 2 you will be giving up the built-in osd but many of us have most of us i think have an osd on our flight controller and you will be giving up the built-in microphone so okay and of course you could always get the eagle pro and just put a wider angle lens on it and then still run at 4.3 with a wider field of view. There you go. Now you know if the information you need, and you can decide for yourself. You got any questions? Or is there anything you think I missed or overlooked? Leave it down in the comments. I will be there answering your questions as always. Thanks for watching. Happy flying.